All right. All right, folks. So like I said, we're going to start with 4.6 here today. We're going to remind ourselves about some equation solving. And then we're going to go back into 4.5, talk about why we really need 4.5, and then bring it back full circle to our equation solving. Okay. So let's start off with what we know. Um, what we know so far, I would say, is sort of split into two categories. Um, we know that we have y equals ab to the x, and that's something called an exponential function. And um, we know that a stands for the starting value, b stands for the growth or decay rate, and then x is how much time has happened, and then y is sort of like our ending number, okay? Now, if I wanted to solve for x, the first thing that I would do here is I would divide both sides by the a. Okay, so in an attempt to isolate my x, I would divide both sides by a. And we saw that when we were doing the word problems, but I don't think we've seen those in uh, quite a few days. So I just wanted to remind us that we divide by that a value to start to get the base and the exponent by itself. Now from here, then we go ahead and we rewrite it in log form. So we get x equals log base b of y over a, okay? And that in a nutshell is really what we're gonna be using a lot in this section with exponential equations, okay? So if we were to kind of break this down into, um, a few steps, we could say that we divide by a, so we divide both sides by a, and then we rewrite in log four. Okay. So as sort of a general statement, we divide by a and then we rewrite in log form. Now, one thing we've seen a little bit less of is we know that there's an, a log equation, log base b of x equals y. And if we wanted to get the x out of the log, then we actually rewrite it in exponential form. So that would be b to the y equals And so similarly, if we were to describe what's happening here, we are rewriting in exponential form. And the whole reason why we have logs is because since we have exponentials, we need a way to undo those logs. And so exponential and logs are those inverse functions that we talked about. And it's really important for us to know that we use one to undo the other, okay? So today we're gonna to look at solving equations with a few different layers, all right? We're gonna take a look at solving exponential equations and solving logarithmic equations. And for both cases, we're gonna talk about what happens if we have the same base, what happens if we need to use the exponential or log form, And then what will happen if we need to use some log property? Okay. So let's jump right in. Okay, we're gonna take a look at this first um, bullet point, which is solving exponential equations. And we're gonna take a look at a case where the bases are equal to each other. So if we take a look at example one here, we've got two to the x minus one equals two to the two x minus four. Now I think from here we can see that since the bases are equal to each other, then we can say that this exponent has to equal this exponent. 
Right. Does that make sense to folks that if you have the same base here, then really the only thing you're trying to play with is setting the exponents equal to each other. Right. And maybe a more simple case of that is like, what if I asked you three to the X equals three to the five? Like what does X equal there? Yeah, x equals five, right? And so we're using the same idea to say, we've got the same base, so one exponent must be equal to the other exponent. And so of course, this three to the x equals three to the five is way simpler, because then our equation is just x equals five, but we can use the same thinking here, for example, number one, where we can say x minus one equals, ooh, 2x minus 4. Okay. So all we've done is checked that, yes, the bases are the same. So one exponent has to equal the other exponent. And then we get an equation that is pretty straightforward to solve. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract the x to both sides. And at the same time, I'm going to add 4. To both sides. Okay, so negative 1 plus 4 is going to give me 3, and then 2x minus x will give me 1x, so I've got a solution of x equals 3. Okay. All right, any questions on that first example? Okay, well, let's take a look at example number two then. So how, how is this in the category of when the bases are equal? Because one of the bases is three and one of them is nine. So if you were to say, oh, five X minus eight equals X plus two, I would give you a big fat red X here. That's not correct. Why is that not correct? Yeah, the bases aren't equal to each other. Okay. Now I know right now it's like, this is pretty obvious, but you, the bases are not equal. Okay, so we can't say that that's true. But sometimes like on a test or something, we're like, I don't know, I just remember her saying set the exponents equal to each other, right? So we just wanna make sure that we're really clear. We set them equal to each other when the bases are equal. But what we can do is with a little bit of work, make the bases equal. So for example, I have three to the five X minus eight equals, what's another way to write nine? three squared, excellent. Not three to the third, we've got three squared, okay? So I can replace nine with three squared, and then I still have my x plus two here, okay? So we're almost, we've got the same base now, but it's not always clear to me what the exponent is. So let's simplify a little bit more before we set them equal. So three to the five X minus eight equals three to the, what's the exponent on the right hand side? What's the whole exponent on the right hand side? Okay, I have Laura saying two X plus four. She's correct. Can someone describe how she got that? Yeah, exactly. She's going to take this 2 and distribute it to the x and that 2, and you get 2x plus 4. Okay. 
what that means is now I can say, hey, take this exponent, set it equal to this one, all right? But we have to make sure we do that work first, okay? So that gives us an equation that's no, nothing more than 5x minus 8 equals 2x plus 4. Okay. All right, I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. I'm going to add 8 to both sides. I get 3x equals 12, and then I get x equals 4. Okay? So when the bases are equal, you can set the exponents equal and have a very straightforward equation. Example number one is like super, super straightforward. Example two requires you to do a little bit of work, all right? but it's the same concept, right? So there's that variation there. All right, let's take a look at one more where the bases are the same, okay? So same thing, we're looking at example three and we're like, okay, our instructor's clearly crazy because there's not equal bases on both sides. It doesn't look anything like example one or really even like example two, okay? So let's see how we've made this variation, all right? So what might be a good first step here if I'm trying to solve for x? <clears throat> 36 divided by 3. Ah, okay. So if we take this 36 and we divide it by that 3, we're actually violating PEMDAS, okay? So if I do 36 divided by 3, this does not, oops, does not follow our order of operation. So that is actually a really good first thought, right? But we also want to talk about why that might not be the best first move. Did I interpret what you were saying incorrectly? All right, so Richard says divide by 36. Oh, okay. So if we're dividing by 36, let's go up here for a moment. When we had y equals a, b to the x, right? When we had y equals a, b to the x, the first thing we did to get the x by itself was divide by that a value. So let's go back down here for a moment. This is my A, one third is my B, this is my Y, right? All they did in this problem was almost write it the other way around. So maybe it's not so clear that we have a Y equals AB to the X, but yeah, let's try that divide by 36. So I'll get one third to the x over five equals four over 36. Okay. Now I feel like reducing fractions is a place that most if not all of us feel fairly comfortable. So when we reduce our four over 36, Look what we get, one ninth. Now, it's not that one ninth by itself is like a super awesome number or anything. Why am I so excited that it's a one ninth? And here's a hint, I might be just as excited if it was like a one over 27 or a one over 81. Yeah, the three and the nine, right? The three and the nines are in the denominator. And nine is a multiple of three, excellent. 
good, good. Mm -hmm. So we can even simplify this more to say one third to the x over five equals one third squared. Very nice connection there, okay? Now, with all of this set up, look what we've created for ourselves. Same base on both sides. And so x over 5 is going to be equal to 2. And so we can set that up, x over 5 equals 2. All right, how do we solve for x here? Yeah, pretty cool, huh? Yeah, we're going to multiply both sides by 5. So I get x equals 10. OK? So let me just zoom all the way out for a moment so you can see all three questions that we took a look at that have when the bases are equal, OK? So I think sometimes when we think, oh, when the bases are equal, we only think about example one. But when we do that, what, what happens is we sort of shortchange ourselves. We don't let ourselves draw upon all that we already know about solving equations and what we know about powers to actually create the situation where the bases are equal, okay? So in thinking more towards tomorrow's exam, I think examples two and three are a little bit more of the level that I hope to see from this class, okay? A little bit less like example number one. I think example number one shows me you understand a concept, but example number two and three shows me, hey, you, can, you understand that concept and got a little bit of confidence in just like how you solve um, equations that may or may not be exponential, but that you know what other strategies to use to make it look like something you can solve. Okay. Any questions on one, two, or three? All right, let's move on. Let's see if questions come up. Okay, so this next category is like, what happens when the bases are not equal? Okay, so let's kind of go up back to the top for a moment. And we said that when we have an exponential function, that our go-to for the word problems was to divide by a and then rewrite it in log four. Okay, so maybe what we can say then is the same bases we don't need log form, okay? So we could use it, but we don't need to. And it, what we're gonna look at now is like what happens when we actually can benefit from writing it in log form, okay? So remember, the one with the exponent is your b, is your base, and then we're gonna do log base b of y over a, okay? So let's go back down. All right, so if I take a look at um, example four here, <clears throat> what's the A value? Yeah, the A value is one. <clears throat> we could also think that the one has, or the A value has already div been divided away. Right, so whether we divide by one or not is not going to change it. And so what we can do from this point is rewrite in oops, log form. Okay, so <clears throat> when you see something like this, that is just a b to the x equals a number, your immediate thought should be rewrite this in log form. Okay. So when we do that, we get log, what's our base here? Look good, log base four of seven equals x, all right? And if I say leave it as an exact answer, this is fine. This is considered an exact solution, all right? 
So as we move on, and I'm thinking more towards like uh, trigonometry or 104 and in 150 um, and beyond that, you know, 151, 252, all of those other math courses, a lot of times we don't care so much to type things into the calculator. It's okay to leave it as an exact solution, okay? I do want to show us how to type this into the calculator, though, because I think that's a separate skill that is important to know how to do. You can also, if I wanted to type log base 4 of 7 into the calculator, I could do it one of two ways. You could type log 7, and remember, your calculator will open up a parentheses for you. So even though you didn't do that, you got to close the parentheses and then divided by log of four, and same thing, they're gonna open a parentheses, so you have to remember to close it, okay? This is one way that you can type log base four of seven into your calculator. Another way you can do it is type it in like this, natural log seven over natural log four. And both of those, log and natural log, are both buttons on your calculator. So I think they're equally easy to access. But maybe you just want to check for yourself that you do get the same answer when you type in both ways. Okay? But just to get a little vocab here, these formulas are called change of base. All right, and all we mean by change of base is you're changing these numbers to the same base, and specifically, you're changing them to bases that your calculator can handle. So what's the base for this first pair, log 7 and log 10? Yeah, excellent. This is base 10, right? That's our common log. If we don't write it, we assume that it's 10. And what's the base for the second pair? Good, yeah, it's E, right? And E is around 2.7-ish. Now, if you did type this into your calculator and I asked for an approximate solution, okay, so this is good knowledge for web assigned too. If they say exact solution, then you need to give them no decimal. But if they say give an approximate solution, and they'll usually tell you how many decimal places to round to. So if we round to three decimal places, we should get 1.40. This is our approximate solution. All right? So a pretty straightforward question. All we're doing is rewriting it in log form, practicing that skill. Okay? Any questions on number four? All right, what do I need to do for example five to make it of the form in example number four? Yeah, mm -hmm. we're gonna subtract that 200, okay? So just like if I had written like x plus 200 equals 300, you would all be like, lady, you are out of your mind. Of course I know how to solve that. And you would all subtract 200 and you would get x equals 100, right? So we have something similar here where we have something that we don't know plus 200, but in this case, that something we don't know is one third to the power of x. So it's just a little bit more of a grown up, I don't know what this is, but we start the same way where we're gonna just move that 200 to the other side. Call it combining like terms, whatever you wanna call it, but we're just isolating our b to the x. 
So this will give us 1 third to the x equals 300 minus 200 is 100. Okay. Now, this looks very similar to example number four. The numbers are different, but that's fine. The structure is the same. We have a base to an exponent equals a number. So let's rewrite this in log form. And when we do that, we should get log base one third of 100 equals x. And this would be considered our exact solution. Okay. But if you wanted to find an approximate solution, what would you type into your calculator? Log 100 divided by log of 1 third. Very nice. So log 100, remember that sneaky open and close, divided by log one, one third, and don't forget the sneaky open and close parentheses. You could say, hey, I think that natural logs are going to be much more useful in the future, which is true, and say you want to start getting practice doing that. So you could write ln 100 over ln 1 third, and that would be equally correct. And either way, when you type this into your calculator, you should get negative 4.192 if you round it to three decimal places, okay? So we've got our approximate solution. Yeah, exactly, okay? So this is when we've got our bases that are not equal. Then when they're not equal, we rewrite it in log form. And if it's not already in b to the x, we just got to make it into b to the x. All right, we got to make it into b to the x. We got to get rid of any extra pieces like the 200. We got to get rid of that, OK? Um, that's a great question. So Isa says, do you want us to give the exact solution or approximate solutions on homeworks and quizzes? So for homework, it's going to depend on what WebAssign says. So you have to read the questions really carefully. Um, that was actually probably the most common question I got on Ask Your Professor on WebAssign. So in case you haven't found it, there's a button that says Ask Your Professor. That's the best way to ask me questions about the homework because it sends me a picture of what you typed in so I know where you went wrong. But like, for example, one of the questions said with the stamps was like, oh, your stamp is four cents, but we want you to write the equation in dollars. And a lot of people just typed in four but that would be like a $4 stamp, not a four cent stamp. So you gotta be really careful about that. So when you do the web assigned homework, read carefully. Does it tell you how many decimal places? Then that means you have to round. But otherwise they'll say exact solution. And if they don't tell you to round, they usually mean exact solution, okay? Yeah, the problems usually state it, um, and I will try my best to be super clear on what I'm looking for as well. If you're not sure, like let's say I botched, I'm not clear on the directions on test day or whatever, you can always write like all of this. You can say, here's my exact solution, this is my approximate, and then you're sort of covered both ways, okay? Um, let me see, there's one more question. If it's an approximate, will we use a different kind of sign? Yeah, so I think some folks will write like, uh, maybe like x, e no, 
x is about negative 4.192. Um, I'm not super picky about that, I would say, at this point, or really in general. It seems to me like there might be more important things for me to be picky about, like making sure you know like which number goes on the top and on the bottom here. Like that kind of stuff I'm probably going to be more picky about than like a squiggly line. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so let's take a look at examples six and seven. Okay, so six and seven are kind of similar to each other. Um, so we're gonna do one and then we're gonna, we'll have a chance to kind of work on the other one on our own. But what they both share is there's not just one b to the x, there's two b to the x's. There's like one on each side. So in example six, I've got four to the two x plus three on one side. And then on the other side, I have five to the x minus two. So not only do I have two b to the x's, but they're not even the same base like in the first three questions we did. And not only are they not the same bases, it's really hard to make four into five. Like we can't really rewrite five in a way that uses base four, okay? So let's take a look at a strategy that works for questions like six and seven, okay? So when we're looking at six, if we see two b to the x's, all right? So we see two b to the x's and we have no, uh, and bases are not equal, okay? So if we see two b to the x's and the bases are not equal, ah, uh, that's a great idea. Like what if you multiply one side by five and the other by four? But here's the thing, it's an equation. So if you multiply one side by five, you got to multiply the other side by five. Okay, so that's the first problem with that. Or if you want to multiply one side by four, you got to multiply the other side by four. You can't like multiply one side by one number and the other side by another number. Right, and then it, er, that's exactly the, the point I was going to make next, in which Eric says that you're violating PEMDAS. Because you're saying, oh, let me take care of that multiplication first, and then I'll come back and deal with that exponential stuff, okay? So a couple of reasons why that might not be a good strategy to you, okay? Um, so what we're going to do here, and try to bear with me right now for a moment, um, we'll get to the why by the end of the lesson, okay? But what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to do one thing to one side of the equation and do the exact same thing to the other side. Okay, so I like the idea that we should do something to both sides of the equation, but we need to make sure whatever we do is the same. And so that thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to natural log both sides. Okay. So I'm allowed to do this because I'm doing the same thing to both sides of an equation, okay? Now, later on, we're gonna learn why this can happen and that it can happen. But for right now, I'm gonna ask you to trust me a little bit on this. Trust the professor who thinks that Angora has seven letters and not six. Uh, so we're gonna take this exponent, and we're going to bring it down to the front like a coefficient, okay? And so what that's gonna give me on the left-hand side is 2x plus three times natural log of four, okay? But don't go getting your calculators out yet to like find natural log of four. Now, 
imagining the same process, what would the right hand side of this equation look like? x minus 2 times natural log 5. Good. All right. x minus 2 times natural log 5. And again, we'll talk about where this comes from in a little bit. But for right now, just kind of go with it. OK? All right. Now, what we're going to do next is we're going to go ahead and distribute. And so on the left hand side i'm going to distribute this natural log 4 to the 2x and we're going to distribute the natural log 4 to the 3. okay i know normally we do distribution with the number in the front but we can do it with the number on the back end as well on the left hand side that's going to give me 2x natural log 4 plus 3 natural log I want you to take a moment to try and do the same process on the right hand side. When you do that, we should be able to distribute here and here. And we get x natural log 5 minus 2 natural log 5. OK? All right, so where do we go from here? Well, we can kind of think back to like when we're solving equations, like regular equations. One skill that I think we know how to do is to combine like terms. And so I scan through here and I'm gonna pick out the terms that have an X in them, okay? So I've got this term has an X and that's it for the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, this one also has an X, okay? So I'm gonna move them so that they're on the same side. And then the other two terms, like this one and this one, I'm going to move them to the other side because they don't have x's. So that's going to give me 2x natural log 4 minus x natural log 5. Okay, so those are my terms in the blue. All right, I move them to the same side. equals negative 2 natural log 5 minus 3 natural log 4. And those are my terms with the orange, and I move those to the same side. Okay. All right. Now, the reason why I want to get all the terms with x on the same side are so that I can factor out and x. So if I look at the first term, I have an x in it. And if I look at the second term, I have an x in it. So I'm going to undistribute that x. When I undistribute that x, what do I get left in the first term? Good. If I take out that x, not the two, if I take out the x, I get two natural log four. If I take out the x from the second blue term, what do I get? Natural log five, good, Nat minus natural log five. And we're gonna leave the right-hand side alone for right now. All right, um, side question. X times three equals 10. How do I get X by itself? I 
I divide by three, right? Exactly, and so I would get x equals 10 over three. All right, well, how do I get x by itself here in my bottom line of the equation? Yeah, we're gonna divide by the thing in the parentheses. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so we get x equals negative two natural log five minus three natural log four over two natural log four minus natural log five. Okay. For this question, I definitely want us to keep it as an exact answer. Okay. Because this question is more about learning a process that we're going to see again in Calc 1, okay? And it's a very common sort of like equation solving technique, all right? We just have to make sure along the way that we don't violate any of the order of operations or things that we know are true about solving equations where we have to do the same thing to both sides. Okay. All right. So take a moment, look at example number six. Let's see if there are any questions about where things came from or where things went to. Can you tell me more what you mean by the reducing? Like, did you cancel out the natural log five? Oh, um, yeah, if it is reducible, you can certainly reduce, but in this case, I don't think there's anything that we can cancel out. Okay. All right, so let's do this. I'm going to have us, uh, so I'm going to keep this on the screen. I know it's a little bit small, but hopefully you can see example seven on the bottom. Okay, and I'd like to give you a few moments to try this process with example number seven. All right, so I'm going to get started with the steps here. You can kind of look up as you're going along to see how yours matches with mine, okay? But I'm also going to zoom into example number seven. Uh, we'll lose sight of example six for a moment.
All right. So I'm going to interrupt you where you are. Take a look at the work for example seven and let me know if you have any questions about uh, where things came from or where things went. It is, it is plus. I don't, it is plus on the other side. Right, there's no minus sign in front of that. Right, yeah, <laughs> okay, I know. It's basically, this whole problem is like a lot of letters. It's fine, you're fine. <laughs> okay, any other questions about example seven? Yeah, exactly, okay. So the, um, just so we can all see, if you wrote on the top in the numerator, if you wrote negative two LN five plus three LN two, that's still totally fine, okay? Um, and Eric, we will get to that explanation in just a little bit, okay? All right. So let's take a look at one last case of exponential equation, all right? So we're gonna take a look at example eight and example nine. I know this is kind of small right now, but they are similar flavored questions, okay? Now these are the exponential questions that we're gonna answer using factoring, okay? So factoring is one of those skills that if you, it's never too late to learn, first of all, okay? It's never too late to learn how to factor. Uh, it is important that you learn how to factor, that you feel confident about it, okay? Um, it is not okay to say, uh, but I know the quadratic formula and I'm just gonna use that every time. All right, so just so we're setting some, some clear expectations here. It is never too late to know how to factor. So if you're sitting there being like, oh shoot, we gotta factor, uh, it's never too late to learn how to do that. It is important that you do it. And if you invest in that for your mathematical toolkit, you're gonna be able to feel confident about so many other problems instead of being like, I still can't get to the answer because I don't know how to factor, okay? So that's a goal that I have for us, which is feeling confident with our factoring, okay? All right, so let's take a look at example number eight, all right? So example number eight, here's what we're gonna do. Um, we are going to take this equation, okay? We're gonna multiply both sides of the equation by the same thing. And the thing that we're gonna multiply by is we're gonna take uh, three times three to the x plus nine times three to the minus x. And we're gonna multiply that by three to the x, okay? So we're gonna distribute that here, we're gonna distribute that there, and we're gonna do the same thing on the other side where I'm gonna take three to the x and I'm gonna multiply that by 28. And we're gonna be really careful about how we simplify. We do not want to violate any order of operations, okay? Um, so when we take three x, so three to the x times three times three to the x, I really get three times three to the x times three to the x, okay? So let's just write that out for now and not worry so much about simplifying. Plus, when I distribute it to the second term, I'll get nine times three to the x times three to the negative x. And when I distribute over here, I'll get 28 times three to the x. Okay. Now, when I take a look at simplifying this term, 
I really have three times three to the X squared. How did I get that? Yeah, okay, because only two of the values have the exponent, good, okay. So the three, we cannot combine with the three to the x because it doesn't have an exponent, right? But also we go back to a very basic definition of when it means to square something, which is we take that something and we multiply it by itself. That gives us that something squared, right? That's the definition of squaring something. Okay, so now let's take a look at this term. Plus nine What happened to my three to the x times three to the negative x? How come I didn't write that? How come I don't need to write that? Okay, so when we have these, the exponents, we do in fact add them together, okay? So three to the x times three to the negative x actually goes to three to the zero, okay? And to show that step, three to the zero goes to one, so I only need to write the nine, okay? Now on the right-hand side, we can leave this as 28 times three to the x. Now, I'm gonna move everything to one side and I'm gonna set it equal to zero. We're gonna make a substitution here. We're gonna let u equals three to the x. This is gonna be important to come back to, okay? So this is something we're gonna come back to. So if I let u equals three to the x, then my equation becomes three u squared, right? Three to the x squared is u squared minus 28u plus 9. Does everybody see where I got this blue equation? Um, okay, so yes, we see where this comes from. Okay, so u is a popular letter that we use to substitute. It doesn't really matter what letter you use, um, but in Calc 1, in Math 150, we do have a special technique called U substitution. So um, some textbooks will use an A at this point. I like to use the U to get us comfortable with that because at some point in the future, we are gonna be using that letter U, okay? But if you want to use a different letter right now, it's totally fine. Yeah, so, oh shoot. We got a quadratic, right? And, oh shoot, Judy just said that she doesn't want us to depend on the quadratic form, right? True story, I want us to know how to factor. So, if we factor this, right? We wanna think about basically what can I multiply or what can I foil to get back to 3u squared minus 2 at 28u plus 9, okay? So here's a little bit of how I kind of think about it. So when I'm trying to make the first term, I know that my only choices are 3u and u. That's the only way that with whole numbers I can get 3u squared, okay? 
Now, I need to make my last numbers multiply to make nine, okay? Because my last numbers together will have to multiply to make nine. But I also want to make sure that they, if I do the outer terms and the inner terms, that they give me negative 28. And so I play around with some numbers and I'm like, okay, nine and one. My first terms, 3u times u, gives me 3u squared. My last terms, 1 times 9, gives me 9. But in order to make a negative 28 with my outer and inner terms, I need a negative, right, because this gives me negative 27u, and then minus u. Negative 27 minus 1 gives me negative 28. So I can sort of check my answer by foiling, and I can't tell you how important that is, that if you don't feel comfortable with factoring, foil out what you have. If you get back to your previous line, then you know that you're correct, okay? So if I have, once I factor, then I can set each part equal to zero, okay? So I'm going to bring this back up to here where I have 3u minus 1 equals 0, and u minus 9 equals 0. Okay, So 3u minus 1 equals 0, and u minus 9 equals 0. Here's where we have to come back to our um, substitution, this piece right here. So let's isolate you, but then I'm not asking you for an answer for you. I want an answer for x. So we got to get back to like an x equals something, all right? So if I solve this first equation for you, I'm going to add 1 to both sides, and then I'm going to divide by 3. That will give me u equals 1 third. And the second one is a touch easier. I just need to add 9 to both sides, okay? But if you put boxes around that as your answer, not cool, because you only solved for u, and I want you to solve for x. So instead of a u equals one-third, we need to write 3 to the x equals one-third. So we substitute our x back in at the end. And same thing here. Not u equals 9, but 3 to the x equals 9. Okay. Now let's solve this second one first. 3 to the x equals 9. I know that x equals 2. Right? That's pretty straightforward. 3 to the x equals 1 third. What is our x equal here? Yeah, negative one, right? It's not one, but it's going to be negative one. Okay. So moral of the story here is that quadratics never quite go away. In fact, quadratics are extremely helpful for solving equations that are a little bit more complicated, that they give us an access point. Okay. So I think sometimes we need to reframe like the power of factoring, not factoring as, oh, no, it's that thing I can't do, but factoring in that, oh, if I know how to do this, I can answer so many more questions, okay? All right. <clears throat> so I think sometimes it's helpful to just kind of see the process again. So let's do number nine together, all right? Let's do number nine together, see how this is a variation of number eight and what we can keep and what we can change from that structure, okay? So let me scroll down, okay. So I've got e to the two x minus e to the x equals 56. So Gloria, it's a negative one because three to the x, if I put in three to the one, that's just three. That's not one third. Right, you wanna get one third out, not three. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. So on to example number nine. Okay. So one thing that I tend to find helpful is anytime I see sort of like this, sort of like a square and sort of like a regular power, my first instinct is, ooh, I hope this is a quadratic. Because if it's a quadratic, then I can use my fancy factoring to solve it. Okay. So anytime we get to a quadratic, our goal is really to get everything equal to zero. So I'm gonna take this 56 and I'm gonna move it to the other side. Okay. Now, one thing I can do is rewrite it so it looks like this, e to the x squared minus e to the x minus 56, okay? And what's nice about this problem is this funky step up here, whoops, up here where I multiplied by that three to the x, I don't have to do that for number nine. The reason why I don't have to do that is because I already have that squared power in the problem. Okay. I already have the squared, so I don't need to multiply by anything. What would be a good substitution to make for example number nine? e to the x, brilliant, very nice. So let u equal e to the x. Okay, so that gives us u squared minus u minus, oh, minus u minus 56 equals zero, okay? This one is a little bit easier to factor. Only way to get u squared is u times u. And what are some factors of 56 that also add or subtract to make negative one? Negative eight and seven, beautiful. So negative eight and seven. Okay, and if you're not confident on that, foil it back out to make sure that you're getting what you started with. Okay. But what we can do from here, now that we factored, is have our two mini equations. And solve for u. Okay. But we don't want to box off our answer there. We want to make sure we solve for the correct letter. So we substitute back in. And we have to isolate our x. How do I get x by itself for e to the x equals 8? Natural log, good, log base e, I love it, I love it. Okay, so that means that x equals log base e of eight. All right, now I would want you to keep this as an exact answer, but just for kicks, uh, could you type that into your calculator and tell me what you get to, let's say, three decimal places? Yeah, about 2.079-ish, okay? Not super mathematical. I wouldn't write ish with any other professor, but you know, we get the point, right? The point is that we know this is an exact versus an approximate answer. Okay, how do we isolate x in e to the x equals negative seven? Yeah, 
we would get natural log of negative 7, okay? A few things here. Let's say you don't have access to a calculator. So then you couldn't find an exact value. You don't know whether it works or not. A good thing to go back to is your graph. So if I graph natural log, okay? Natural log of eight would be somewhere like here. It's a point on the graph. But natural log of negative seven, negative seven is like way out here somewhere. So it's not in the domain of our function, which means that when you try and type natural log of negative seven into your calculator, what do you get it? A domain error. Yeah, that's usually what pops up is it says there's a domain error. Or it says non-real number. Okay. This is not a solution. Only this one is. Okay. If you don't like using the log graph, you could also use the exponential graph to think about it. So an exponential graph looks like this, right? If I wanted to think about e to the x equals 8. Like, is there a point here that gives me an x, a y value of 8? And yeah, that might be here. This would be x comma 8. But if I try and do the same thing with e to the x equals negative 7, there's no point on the graph that has an x value or a y value of negative seven. Not possible to have a y value of negative seven. Okay. So there's a lot of ways in which we can kind of think about whether an answer works or doesn't work, okay? So one way certainly is you can like graph things on a calculator and be on your merry way uh, or type them into a calculator and call it a day. But I think it's also important to understand on a deeper level like why that answer doesn't work, okay? And that goes back to if you look at your notes for logs, we cannot put negative numbers into logs, right? All right, so those are our examples for exponential equations, okay? Um, let's, I think this is a good time to take a break, okay? So let's go ahead, it's about 11 o'clock, let's be back at 11.10, and then we will resume with 4.6 and 4.5, okay? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna open share my screen. All right. So the last two examples we did were sort of a reminder of how powerful factoring can be, um, but also to think about like what kind of answers work and what kind of answers don't work, okay? So to kind of summarize the first part of class, we can take a look at this right here, where when we have an exponential form, these are some general good steps to follow, which is isolate the exponential, rewrite it in log form, and then solve for your unknown, okay? Um, on the flip side, what we're about to do is take a look at log equations. And so to solve log equations, our goal is going to be to get the log all by itself, rewrite it in exponential form, and then solve for the unknown, okay? And it's going to be 
um, here in the log form part where we take a look at some sections of 4.5, right? So before we get there, let's take a look at um, what happens when we're solving a basic case of logs where the bases are equal to each other, okay? So we'll kind of start the same way that we did with the exponentials. So looking at example number 10, what do folks think we could do as a strategy? x squared equals 2x plus 3. Yeah. So I noticed right away, for example, number 10, that they both have a natural log on uh, in front. Okay. What that means is the natural log of x squared is equal to our natural log of 2x plus 3. And just like we did with the exponential ones where we had the same base, when we have the logs that are the same base and there's only one of each, we can then set it up to say x squared equals 2x plus 3. So this is just the thing that's being natural logged on the right hand side, and this is the thing that is being natural logged on the right, on the left hand side. And so let's set these equal to each other, see what we get. So we get x squared equals 2x plus 3. Ah, what do we do from here? This is actually a really nice transition from what we just talked about in exponentials. What's a good strategy here to get x? Yeah, exactly. We see the square and we want to think, move everything to one side, set it equal to zero so that we can factor, okay? So what we don't want to do is square root both sides. That's not going to be helpful, okay? Yeah. Now, I know Richard brings up a really good point. You can move the x squared or you can move the 2x plus 3. Um, I like to keep my x squared positive, so it makes it easier for me to factor. That's why I move the blue to the left-hand side, okay? Now, if we factor this, we're going to get, let's see, what makes x squared is x and x. What makes 3 is going to be 3 and 1. Perfect. So 3 and 1. Now, in order to make a negative 2x, so I need a negative 3 and a positive. Exactly, the negative three plus one equals negative two. Good, so now we have our mini equations. We can say x minus three equals zero and x plus one equals zero. And we get x equals three and x equals negative one, okay? Now here's one thing that I'm gonna strongly encourage you to do when we're looking at log equations. When you get your answers, instead of I'm just assuming that they're going to work, what we want to make sure we do is we check. Because we need to take 3 and negative 1 and plug them back into the original and make sure that we don't get a situation. So we want to avoid natural log of a negative value okay we don't want that if we get the natural log of a negative number that means that that's not going to be part of our solution for the reasons that we talked about earlier okay so if i plug three back into the original do i get a natural log of a negative anywhere
Yeah, no, I don't. What about if I plug in negative one? Do I get natural log of a negative anywhere? Where do I get that? Mm, okay, I think Eric, you are correct. Because if we plug in negative one, we've got natural log of negative one squared, which is a positive number, okay? And then if we plug in, so negative one squared equals natural log of a positive. And if I do natural log of two times negative one plus three, when I simplify what's inside here, I get a positive. So neither case gives me the negative. That means that both x equals 3 and x equals negative 1 are correct answer. Okay. So it's not that you can't plug in a negative number. It's that the thing in the parentheses cannot be negative. Okay. All right. What about example 11 here? Can we use the same strategy we did in number 10 or do we have to modify it somehow? Same strategy, different strategy. What do we think for number 11? Yeah, same strategy, right? Our base this time, it's not E, it's 13, but it's the same on both sides. So I can say 5X minus two is equal to eight minus 5X. 5x minus 2 equals 8 minus 5x. I'm going to go ahead and add 5x to both sides, and I'm going to add 2 to both sides. So I get 10x equals 10. And I get x equals 1. Now we want to make sure we only have one answer to check this time, but let's plug it back into the original. And do we get the log of a natural thing, a negative thing? Like is the thing in the parentheses ever negative when we plug in one? And our answer should be no. So that means that x equals one is a solution for this equation. So these two, I think, are pretty straightforward in the sense that they are similar to those bases are equal for the exponentials, right? Life is always easy when the bases are equal. So now let's take a look at situations where when the bases are not equal, okay? So when the bases are not equal, I've got log base 3 of 9x plus 2 equals 4. So in this case, I can't just say 9x plus 2 equals 4, because there's no log base 3 on the other side. So I can't just say, oh, let me just get rid of the log, OK? Instead, what strategy should I use that we've seen from above? Yeah, change to exponential, change to exponential. Okay, so exponential means we need to rewrite this. All right, so let's rewrite in exponential form, okay? So we've got our base, our base is three. Base to the power of what? Base to the power of 9x plus 2 or base to the power of 4? Four? 4. Good, good, good. Okay. So 3 to the 4th power equals negative uh, ooh, 9x plus 2. Okay. Now, 3 to the 4th is kind of a common number. It's nice to know. Um, but 3 to the 4th is 81. 
equals 9x plus 2. And I think this is something we feel pretty good about. We're going to subtract 2 from both sides, and then we're going to divide by 9. So x equals 79 over 9. Okay? Before we box this answer off, we want to do a quick look. If I plug in 79 over 9, does it give me a negative number inside of those parentheses? And I think we can tell that it's going to be a positive. I don't know what the number is, but it's going to be positive. So that means that this answer is a solution. Okay, so make sure to do that check for yourself before you just say, oh yeah, here's my answer. Okay, make sure that it works when you plug it back in and it has to be plugged into the original one in order for that to work. All right, let's take a look at example 13. How is this similar to 12 and how is it different? Same first step. Okay, I love it. Same first step because I already have a log. The difference here, and I tend to do this for myself when I'm writing problems, is the base here is 10. They didn't write it for me, but I'm expected to know that. You're expected to know that. So do yourself a favor, write it in so that you don't get to rewriting it and be like, I don't know what number's there, okay? So our first step is going to be the same, rewrite in exponential form. That means we're going to have 10 to the power of 2 equals 5x minus 11. Okay. And 10 squared, 100 equals 5x minus 11. Very similar to 12, it's a pretty straightforward equation. So I'm gonna add 11 to both sides, and then I'm gonna divide by the five, okay? I do wanna do a check before I box off that answer. When I plug it in here, is it gonna give me a negative answer or inside the parentheses? And that is no, so I can box this off and know that it does not give me a negative number in the parentheses, so it is a solution for the equation. Okay. All right, any questions so far on 12 and 13? Let's try number 14. What do we need to do here? How is this similar? How is this a variation? Okay. How come we didn't divide by five first? Um, order, when you're solving an equation, you usually do order of operations backwards. So you look for any addition, subtraction, you move that first. But if you divided by five first, you would get 20 equals x minus, you better divide that by 5 too. And my guess is most people who divide by 5 forget to divide that one by 5, and then you'll get the wrong answer. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so in looking at example 5, yeah, it's a couple extra steps. But our goal is still isolate our log, right? We want to isolate it so then we can use strategies from example 12 and example 13. All right. So I think this is actually, I'm really glad that you asked that question, Natalia, because here I think it's a little bit more obvious that you shouldn't divide by three first. You could, but you'd end up with a lot of fractions. And I feel like, why go there if you don't have to, right? So I would say maybe a good first step is to minus four from both sides. 
and then after you minus four, then divide by the three, okay? So we should get natural log of x minus three equals one third. Okay, so we still end up with a fraction at the end, but we didn't need to deal with fractions during the problem. Now, just like I wrote base 10 in example three, sometimes, especially if it's like a new thing for me, I might take the time to write log base e of x minus three equals one third. Then it makes me really clear to me what the base is and how I rewrite it. Okay? You don't have to do this step if you don't want to. It's fine if you know how to go straight from the natural log. But either way, we're going to rewrite it in exponential form. And that's going to give us e to the one third equals x minus three. Now we get x minus 3 equals another way to write e to the one third is the cube root of e. Okay. So then the last step to get x by itself is add 3. Now this would be an exact answer. So if web assign doesn't tell you how many decimal places to round to, then you would leave it like this. And if you wanted to type it into the calculator, I believe you get about 4.396. Okay. And that value might be more helpful to show you that when you plug it back into the original, you're going to get a positive number. And so this solution works. And we can say that this is our answer. All right. OK. Um, great question, Richard and Eric. Would it matter if we did the third root of e or e to the one third? No, it would not. Now, the reason why I do this a lot, where I want us to know that like x to the one half is the same as the square root of x, or x to the one third is the same as the cube root of x, this is going to be super useful in calculus, like really, really useful. And it's such a small thing that I know we know how to do, but we don't always do it regularly enough to remember. Okay, but think about this more like, okay, I'm preparing to make it easy, my life easier when we get to calculus, all right? So that's the only reason I try and show both of those. The other reason is that sometimes we can find buttons on a calculator and sometimes we can't. So like if you see the cube root and you're like, I can't find that button on my calculator, but you know where your power button is, whoops, sorry. You can always just type in, like if you want to do eight to the one third power and you type that in your calculator that's the same as the cube root of eight even if you can't find the cube root button. okay so just like a few reasons why i might cho choose to do that but for right now it doesn't matter which one you do all right how are we doing here so far folks Still thinking about those Angora rabbits? Okay. So let's take a look at example 15 for a moment here. Example number 15. Thoughts. What, what can I do from my strategies from before? What can I not do?
Right. Okay. So I really love what Eric said here. He said you can't use the methods where the bases are the same because there's this person, this, this folk right here. There's two hanging out. And that two does not have a log. Okay. So it's not a situation where I can say, hey, let's just, uh, you know, get rid of the logs. And then I, whoa, all of a sudden have this equation. It's almost like when we did these kinds of questions, where we saw more than one exponential and they didn't all necessarily have the same powers. So we couldn't just get the bases to be the same and then have them equal to each other, okay? And so, yeah, exactly. So this, you've probably seen these properties that we're about to talk about before, but for these kinds of questions, we're gonna need to use our log properties, okay? And the reason why we're gonna use our log properties is we want to turn this into a single log. So not more than one log, not two logs. Two logs is like a little bit crazy town, just one log, okay? Just one log. So with that being said, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen here for a moment. And I'm going to 